So now it's time to get into some cell structure and function. So what we're looking at here is essentially a phylogenetic tree that shows an example of the relatedness of different groups of organisms that we know of on this planet. And the things that I want to bring out are we've got three domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. We are part of the eukarya, and this is actually one of our immune system cells that is reaching out and grabbing bacteria, pulling it in, and it's going to pull it in to eat it. And we'll talk about that. The eukarya are represented down here. We are on this branch, Homo, and that branch is representing all animals. Every single animal is represented by that. So this is very rudimentary. This is representing all fungi. This is representing all plants. And then the rest of these are all microbes. These are all microbes over here, the archaea, the so-called extremophiles. And these are some groups of bacteria. Uh, you'll see that mitochondria is mixed in with bacteria. Uh, however, we have mitochondria, so why is that? Well, mitochondria, as you read in Deadly Companions, uh, evolved from bacteria. Okay, so uh, know the three domains of life. Know bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Know that you are part of this. And in terms of uh, the most infectious group, that is definitely the bacteria. And so first, let's just talk a little bit about eukaryotic cells. We're not going to go into a lot of uh, depth right now. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more when we talk about fungi and other eukaryotes, such as protozoa. But let's just look at some basics right now. And so a lot of this is just basic biology that, that you had in high school and other places. And so what we see is that you know there are a lot of different shapes. These are just two sizes and shapes of human cells, eukaryotic cells. And the things to know is that, yes, their, their DNA is in a nucleus. Uh, they have a lot of compartmentalization via organelles. Uh, and on this image, I'm not going to go over it, but know all of these stars. We will talk a little bit about that in this particular image. So again, this is one of your immune system cells that's reaching out. So how does it do that, right? Well, these pseudopodia can reach out like this due to cytoskeletons. And so cytoskeletal filaments, for example, they are proteins inside the cell and they can assemble and they can get longer and longer and longer and longer and longer, pushing out through a membrane and so you can get these pseudopods, these appendages. And that's what we're looking at here. And so when we look at this coming out, when it brings in the bacteria, what happens then? Well, let's look at this. So this is a general scheme for phagocytosis. And what we have is a bacterium getting pulled in a variety of ways, one of which is shown over here. And then it is what's called, it's in a phagosome, which is a food vesicle. And that is basically the membrane kind of blebs inward. And now you've got this sphere where the bacteria is in it. And then we have a lysosome, which blebbed off of the Golgi body, and this lysosome has a lot of enzymes in it. It has other things as well. But when that lysosome fuses with the phagosome, you get this phagolysosome. And so once all these enzymes are in there, a lot of things happen, but all I want you to know is that essentially the, whatever's in there will get degraded, and that's what we're seeing right here. So problem solved. There was a bacteria. This is actually eating it. Okay, and so nutrients that are released from that go into this cell to help power it, uh, and then what is excreted is waste. And so that is an example of how individual cells in your immune system, and we'll talk about this more later on in the course, uh, use a cooperation of different organelles and different intracellular components, such as the cytoskeleton, moving the membrane, grabbing the bacteria, pulling it in, creating a phagosome from the cell membrane, and then a lysosome comes along, fuses with that, pumps, pumps in or pushes in a whole bunch of lytic enzymes, just like your digestive enzymes, and breaks apart the bacteria, uses those nutrients for energy as well as building blocks, and then excretes it. And so uh, in terms of knowing the different organelles, I want you to know the organelles and the cell structure components of eukaryotic in this context. So we're not just memorizing them to memorize them. No phagocytosis. So let's get to prokaryotic cells. Okay, so uh, let's get right into, again, we're going to go ahead and talk about this instead of going over text, but that's there to help you. So what we're seeing here is an image under an electron mic microscope, not the kind you have. And so this is false colored, but what it's showing you is, in this case, uh, we've got a bacterium here with a whole bunch of flagella coming out. 
the cell wall, which is showing you right here on the inside. So there's a cell wall inside. Inside the cell wall is the plasma membrane, and outside the cell wall, in this particular instance, there's a glycocalyx, which we'll talk more about. Okay, so the flagella allows swimming. And then what we have, uh, I've added this plasmid here to this diagram, uh, and they carry additional genes. Okay, so for example, antibiotic resistance genes are often carried on plasmids, and we'll talk more about that. Okay, so uh, all along the edge here are pili. Uh, attachment pili, also called fimbria, which allow bacteria to attach to surfaces. So we're going to talk more about that in these following slides. So flagella, uh, this is an image from your reading over here, and it corresponds to images such as over here. And so know that all of these long squiggly things on here allow these bacteria to swim. You don't need to know these terms, but know that different bacteria have different complements of flagella. Okay, so now we have an example of a couple bacterium, and what we've got here is the short protrusions. These are proteins, they're protein tubes, which actually can help bacteria hold on to each other and other, other things, okay? And the long ones are flagella, okay? So a bacterium can have a variety of different, it can have no flagella and no fimbria. This one has both. This over here, this bacterium, has this long tube, and, and I wish this image had another bacteria over here because that's what's going on. This is transferring a plasmid down here. So a plasmid is going from one bacterium to the other one. Okay, but even though this doesn't have it, let's look at this. This is the same thing going on over here, but this is now a transmission electron microscope where we see the insides. And so this bacterium is conjugating with one, two, three different bacteria. So think about that. Those tubes that are connecting them are the sex pilus, and they are transmitting DNA back and forth between cells. So that allows a bacteria to gain a whole new set of genes on the plasmid. And so the plasmid is DNA, it contains genes, and antibiotic resistance is passed from one type of bacteria to another bacteria quite readily through this particular example. Okay, and that's what's showing up here as well. These are salmonella caught in the act. Okay, and then over here we've got another example where we're seeing fimbria and flagella. So remember, so this example, right, that my, my former student Dave made for me, uh, what he was showing here is that these are fimbria, uh, which are also called attachment pilots, pili, and so they allow bacteria to physically attach to things. Okay, so for pathogenesis, being able to attach inside your body to a surface is really important. Also, if you go walking on in a stream and you're walking on slippery rocks and it's kind of goopy, that's probably a biofilm on them. And so you can also have a glycocalyx. And so, and then here we've got a flagella. If this is real flagella, it would be, it would be longer than this. Okay, so, so keep, keep in mind that uh, a fimbria and a sex and a, um, an attachment pilus are the same thing. A sex pilus allows the transfer of plasmids and uh, flagella allows it to swim. So moving on, uh, the glycocalyx is the external component of some bacteria that also makes, makes them slimy. So capsules and slime layers. So if we look at these images, uh, well, we see the different types of images, but the key thing is that it's, it's, it's got this coating. So in this case, this green coating right here. In this case, this orange coating, and these are colorized, right? It's like filling in the color so they don't actually look like that. And here is a slime layer where it's more diffuse. Okay, so the, the things I want you to know about this is that it keeps the bacteria moist, right? In conditions of dryness, if they've got a capsule, that's a nice barrier. It also allows them to keep uh, unwanted things out, such as antibiotics. Okay, so uh, it allows your it it allows bacteria to hide from the immune system. So antibiotics might not I mean antibodies might not be able to bind to it, and immune system cells might not be able to recognize it. And it allows it to attach. So in other words, attachment. We're seeing a number of things. Attachment pili, also called fimbria, can allow bacteria to attach. Right, that's like the fingers. Some of them actually kind of uh, actually grab on and then pull in and actually allow bacteria to move, which is pretty crazy as well. Uh, and so uh, all of these together uh, are really important. Capsules, slime layers. You don't need to know the specific things that are individual for capsules and slime layers and glycocalyx. Just think of them all as the same thing. Okay? They're a sugar coating that prevents it from drying out, helps it stick, helps it evade immune systems. 
And so, for example, uh, here's Neisseria gonorrhea, and this would be called a diplococcus. We'll talk about that in another lecture because there's two, and these are coccus shaped. And so these bacteria have both fimbria and capsule, and that's what this glowing halo is due to a staining technique. And basically, uh, Neisseria, oh, well, I thought this was gonorrhea, but this is Neisseria meningi meningitis. Uh, and this bacteria, if it loses the ability to produce fimbria or capsule, then it turns out it is not pathogenic. So it needs both of those to be pathogenic. Okay, so these are virulence factors. These are components that allow the bacteria to successfully kind of take up residence in a host. Okay, and so, and then we'll talk more in the oral uh, microbiology section, which is very brief, uh, but this right here is showing a bunch of streptococcus mutans, and then there's all this goopy stuff around it, and they attach and form uh, plaque in your teeth uh, by capsule slime layers and fibria. So it really is, in a lot of ways, all about attachment to the host. So here is a, an image from, uh, from one of your readings. So we're just trying to reinforce things. Now this is this right here is showing a capsule. It would go all the way around. Okay, so this is kind of splitting things. For example, here the outer membrane would go around also as well. And we've got the attachment pili. We've got flagella. So let's talk more about now uh, a little bit of internal things. So this is another image in your reading. And so what we're seeing is that there's a classification called gram-negative and gram-positive. Okay, so the difference between this, we see cross sections of the outer portion, right, that what's holding it all together of the cell. If we go down here, this is a poor image, but I wanted to at least pull one from your reading so that you could recognize and say, okay, when you're reading it, looking at it. But what we're looking at here is start at the bottom. So underneath this is the cytoplasm, and in this case, this really should be flipped the opposite direction because uh, the cytoplasm is on the inside here. So we're looking at the inside down here, uh, and then we've got the inner membrane, which both bacteria have, right? That is the cytoplasmic membrane. And then what we've got for the gram-positive cells is the uh, thick cell wall, and over here in the gram-negative cell, we have a thin cell wall, but then we have an outer membrane. So let's go ahead and look at a few images of gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria and talking about these differences. Okay, so first of all, gram-negative over here. What we have here first is a cell membrane. Then we have peptidoglycan. Then we have outer membrane. Contrast that to this. Cell membrane, peptidoglycan. What is it missing? It has no outer membrane. And what's the difference between this peptidoglycan and this peptidoglycan? That's right. The cell, the gram-negative cell, has a much thinner peptidoglycan layer, okay? Whereas the gram-positive has a much thicker. So if you are to see an image like this, or some type of image of gram-negative and gram-positive, you should be able to label the different components, okay? You should also be able to draw these. So drawing it out would help. I'm not going to ask you to draw it during a test, but uh, I can ask you in a variety of different ways. And so if we look at this again, what we're seeing at uh, the gram-negative is, uh, here's the gram-negative cell. If we kind of do a cutout here of the outer portion, that's what we have right here, different layers. So I just like to think of gram-negative as three layers, gram-positive as two layers. S cell membrane, peptidoglycan, outer membrane. Cell membrane, peptidoglycan. Don't worry about tocoic acids, but you are going to need to know lipopolysaccharide. If you look at where this is, these are all these little squiggly things at the surface of the gram-negative cell. If we go back one, this particular image does not... Now there's lipoprotein. It really doesn't have the lipopolysaccharide shown up here, but if you go down here, what we see right here, lipopolysaccharide. Okay, so see the little branching thing? That's what's showing there. It's on the outer membrane of gram-negative only. Coming out of the outer membrane of gram-negative only, this lipopolysaccharide. So we'll get back to the lipopolysaccharide, but let's look at this image right now. And this image is from your hands-on lab exploration part. Okay, so this is uh, something you'll be seeing in that. So what we have right here, again, gram-negative and gram-positive, both of them have the cell membrane down here. Oops. 
And then there is peptidoglycan next, and the gram positive has a much thicker layer than the gram negative. And then the gram negative has this outer membrane with lipopolysaccharides sticking out of it. So I'm hoping that looking at different images seeks to reinforce the things that I want you to know, right, by following my, uh, my lead here. And so why is the cell wall, okay, this peptidoglycan, why is this, what is, what is some of the importance? Well, here we go. So ideally remember from chemistry that uh, in terms of isotonic, hypertonic, and hypotonic, and that is that, for example, if you look at a isotonic solution, that means that the same concentration of solute is on the outside as it is on the inside. So water can move freely back and forth in and out of the cell, and there's no problem. Okay? Whether this is the cell that has no cell wall, like our cells or other types of microbes like mycoplasmas, or uh, if you do our bacterium with a cell wall, so now we've got peptidoglycan, still water can go back and forth. Now, if you go into a hypertonic, remember hypertonic means there's a higher concentration of solute on the outside. And so you can see that there's actually a higher concentration of dots out here, that's solute, compared to in here. And so what happens is water has a tendency to then go down its concentration gradient, that is, to the region that has more solute concentration. So, so that can happen uh, to some degree, and this can shrivel up. Okay, and this can shrivel up to the point where it gets completely dehydrated. Okay, if it has a cell wall, the cell membrane is physically anchored to the peptidoglycan. Okay, and so that prevents it from getting too dried out. And so the peptidoglycan is helping to maintain the cell from getting too dried out. Okay, if we look over here, this cell wall, um, the cell gets no bigger. So in a hypotonic solution, that means there's a higher concentration of solute in here, and so water will have a tendency to flow into the cell. And if there's no cell wall, then it can get to the point where the cell can burst and lice because it just keeps, water keeps going in, 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 the cell membrane can't hold it, and it blows up. Well, it doesn't really blow up, but it leaks and it breaks, and, and that's the end of the cell. However, if you have a cell wall, then basically that membrane is pushing up against the peptidoglycan, and it maintains its structure, and so what we can see is that in a hypotonic solution, the peptidoglycan prevents the bacteria uh, cell from breaking open and dying. And same thing with the hypertonic, it doesn't get too dehydrated. So now let's talk a little bit about the membrane. So we know that, uh, so gram positive versus gram negative, which one has two sets of membranes? That's right, gram negative. Okay, so membranes in general, as you've learned in other classes, right? Uh, have a phospholipid bilayer, and they also have different proteins embedded in them or attached to one side of, or another. Okay, And the things that I want you to know about this is that this, these are all moving around. And so in the lateral movement, they can all move like this. They're rarely going to flip, but they can move around. And, and the example I like to give is if you put a whole bunch of ping pong balls on a swimming pool, in a swimming pool, they can move around like this on the surface. They're not going to go in, then all of a sudden they come up, but they can move around. And so we can think of that in the same way for uh, these membranes where these proteins can move around. And some proteins are, are kind of anchored and fixed, but others move around a lot. And the various proteins that are in there uh, have a variety of uh, functions. And so the key thing is that uh, when we talk about a specific example, you can classify them in this. Okay? I'm not looking to just give you a list on a test of like, what are the certain proteins that are in the, the cell membrane? Uh, you should know that transporters uh, allow molecules to go into the cell and go out of the cell. You're going to look at a video uh, on, on Blackboard of efflux, and that efflux, meaning out, that pumps molecules out. So outer, the outer membrane of gram-negative uh, is particularly useful in this sense because they have a number of transporter proteins and so some gram-negative bacteria when you give them antibiotics they pump them right out of the cell. Know that about efflux. Gram-negative bacteria pump them out of the cell. They also transport wastes out of the cell, right? All, cell needs, all cells need to get rid of their waste and so that's one way. So transporters help things like sugars get into the cell, right? Because you need to have a selectively permeable membrane, a barrier, that's what it is. And so it only lets certain things in, only lets certain things out. Okay, so 
those are the functions uh, that we need to know about certain proteins. And the other thing is the cytoskeletal uh, filament, right? Maintaining that cell structure is really important. And that's true whether it's an animal cell or a bacterial cell. So if we look at this, uh, this fill in the blank, just do that from your reading. And then when you actually do your gram stain, you'll know it by heart. Okay, so uh, these are just from for you to read. Okay, so here's a little quiz. Which one of these is gram negative and which is gram positive? That's right, gram positive, gram negative. So let's talk about this lipopolysaccharide. Okay, so another quiz. Lipopolysaccharide are only found in which type of bacteria, gram negative or gram positive? Okay, think about it. It's, it's, it, it I'll tell you right now, it's embedded in the outer membrane, so gram negative. Okay, so let's look at this. And so basically, you don't need to know the structure uh, of this, but this right here means that it is embedded in the membrane. And so we can see that up here, right? So this is the gram negative bacteria. And so we have a bunch of lipopolysaccharide here that are embedded right there. And so the reason that we're talking about this right now is the function part of it. So it, it has a function of the bacteria, but the part I want you to know about right now is that this is actually a toxin. And so when the bacteria die, then this is released and triggers fever, inflammation, shock, blood clotting, diarrhea, and essentially this can cause sepsis. So if you have, for example, uh, a bloodstream infection of gram-negative bacteria and they die very quickly, their lipopolysaccharide, that is their endotoxin, is released and can cause septic shock. Okay, and so I just want to show you a quick kind of image from a paper uh, the, back in the day, 1994, and this is just showing the amount of endotoxin that's released from a certain type of gram-negative bacteria using different types of antibiotics. So each one of these lines represents a treatment of a different type of antibiotic, and they're down here. Okay, so, so what we're seeing then, and no antibiotics, is uh, the triangle right here. So no antibiotics, just in their experimental control, we see that some endotoxin is released based on whatever they've got going on in their test tubes. Okay? However, with these three types of antibiotics, look at how much more is released. 500 versus about 120. So four times more endotoxin is released. Okay? And so again, there's a lot more recent papers on this. There's reviews. But the thing I want you to know is that gram-negative bacteria can cause sepsis, septic shock, if they're in your bloodstream and they're releasing endotoxin. Okay, endotoxin is lipid A. Uh, you can just think of endotoxin as lipopolysaccharide. Okay, so uh, that's what I want you to know regarding lipopolysaccharide, which type of bacteria it is, where it is, and uh, what it can do to humans. So now if we go to another strategy of, of kind of waiting it out. So glycocalyx, remember, can prevent a bacterium from drying out, right? So that'll last for a while. But uh, some bacteria have evolved the ability to produce endospores, which some endospores can last thousands of years. Okay, how do we know? Because they've been pulled out of permafrost, they've been pulled out of a variety of, of other very cool old, um, old structures, and endospores are strong. So uh, weaponized anthrax is anthrax spores, okay, because they can withstand a lot. Once, uh, for example, if you breathed in anthrax spores, once they lodged in your lungs and they were in a moist environment at the right temperature with the right chemicals from your cells around, they would then germinate and then they would pop out and then they would be a fully, uh, full bacillus anthracis, which is the species name, uh, and then they could divide, grow and divide, grow and divide, grow and divide, uh, and then uh, you would suffer the consequences of it. So an endospore, very tough. And so this image right here is just showing different layers. Um, you don't need to know all of these, but this is showing, uh, I just think a thin layer uh, cut through, showing an endospore uh, is really cool. Um, and then this image right here is just showing uh, how you go from a cell, the first step is that a cell doubles its DNA. And then it essentially divides the in part of the cell. And then essentially what's happening is it's starting to package this version of the DNA up all the way to the point where there is now a spore. And there's no cell around it, but there's a spore. It needed this DNA leading up to here because it is still expressing genes to allow the formation of this bacterial spore to be formed. 
So in this image, the only thing I want you to know is that a cell will essentially double its DNA and then start wrapping one of them up in a very, very tough coating that can withstand radiation, it can withstand dehydration for thousands of years, and the cell dies around it and then it's left with a spore. So that's what an endospore is. And then this last image, I just, <laughs> I love this. This is from an archaea. So we haven't talked about them except for uh, when we just talked about three domains. And so this right here is uh, half and half where this is an electron micrograph showing a bacterial cell with a whole bunch of appendages. Now, if you were just looking at this, you might say, oh, well, you know, that looks like fimbria or it looks like pili. And I would agree with you. That is what it looks like. This is now a, a, a diagram, right, an artist's rendition. And now check out the end of this. Oh, my goodness. Are, are you kidding me? This is great. This is like a little grappling hook, right? That is, we are physically looking at the molecular structure of what's at the end of each one of those appendages, okay? And so what we see then is that this actually then does allow bacteria to hold on and stick. And so that's what these are. So they essentially, you know, they, they put them out there, they can embed in things, and that it's holding. So I'm leaving it on that because I, when I see molecular images, that shows these structures of molecules that look like something that humans have later invented, right? I mean, humans invented grappling hooks, right? And have used them. And so when we then see that, oh my goodness, there's a molecule that's just like that, it's just, I find it very fascinating. So that's the image that we're gonna leave on. The goal here is to understand some basics about cellular structure and function, not just to know them, not just because, well, we need to know, but because what they do, the function is the important part. Okay, why care about the glycocalyx? Why care about slime layers? Why care about a sex pilus, right? Why, why does it matter to know about lipopolysaccharide? Those are the really important questions. So cell structure and cell function, that's what we're covering. Uh, and that's about all for now.